fans, on today's episode, we talk the conundrum in the Fast and the Furious franchise, Bob Iger's cautious optimism, and a sit-down interview with the director of the Belco Experiment, Greg McLean. Get ready for your 5K experience with personalized rumble seats. It's time for Film HQ. Welcome to this week's installment of Film HQ. I am your host, John Campia, and as always, we have a whole bunch of stuff to cover in the world of movie news, but before we get to it, we want to make sure you're caught up to date. So let's go to our news update with Josh and Haletta. Thanks, John. Hey, guys, I'm Josh McCuga. <laughs> I'm Haletta Oliver. And here is this week's news. The Hollywood Reporter broke news this week that Jared Leto will be starring in Warhol, a biopic about pop artist Andy Warhol. Michael DeLuca of The Social Network will produce along with Leto, while Oscar-nominated writer Terrence Winter will take on script duty. Co-stars should be on the lookout for Leto sending them dead, rotting Campbell's soup cans. Mm, yeah, probably. Director Duncan Jones took to his Twitter to announce that production on his new film, Mute, will begin production in one week. The movie is set in the same universe and the third film in a trilogy along with Moon and Source Code. Mute stars Paul Rudd and Alexander Skarsgård and is sure to leave audiences wondering, is Duncan Jones Ziggy Stardust in real life? I'm a spike. Just so you know. Furiosa, Charlie Theron, scene stealing 1.5 armed NASCAR Apocalypse Desert Series winner, is getting her own prequel. According to Australia's Herald Sun, the prequel is not only in the works, but could start shooting this year with George Miller at the helm. Cue the doof for your ominous guitar solo. As of this moment, we are only. 82 days, 12 hours, 39 minutes, and 51, 50 seconds from the release of Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. But of course you knew that. Disney CEO Bob Iger is, however, cautiously optimistic, telling Variety that we never thought it would be as big as The Force Awakens. But based off of the response to the trailers, the level of interest is as high. Yeah, Bob, no duh, it's Star Wars. Come on, man. Come on, man. Yeah. Anyway. John Wick Chapter 2 hits theaters February 10th, 2017, and director Chad Stahelski spoke to EW telling fans there would be twice as much action from John Wick, who loves killing everyone except for Sarah McLaughlin. So the first movie was 101 minutes, 100 of which were action and one minute of snuggling. So is there a bomb on a bus on this one, or...? No. A few weeks ago, we discussed Antoine Fuqua's upcoming Scarface remake, and this week, the director spoke to Fandango about why doing a Scarface right now is important. The Magnificent Seven director said, with what's happening in Mexico, which is where the main character comes from, that's relevant. We're still dealing with what would turn someone into Scarface. No release date has been set for Sicario Face. I mean, Scarface. <laughs> Spider-Man Homecoming doesn't swing into theaters until July 7th, 2017, but audiences are chomping at the bit for anything from production. So, when fans snap pictures of stunt doubles dangling from a helicopter, the internet literally exploded. If you look closely, you'll see Mary Jane's stunt double taking a cell phone video of the experience. So, hold on, let me look at my Apple agreement. Yup, uh, nope, yeah, it doesn't cover hack, helicopter damage in the warranty, so, mm -hmm. sorry mm -hmm. about that. Well, Mark Wahlberg told Jimmy Fallon this week that he and LeBron James are working on a movie together based on the idea of an adult basketball fantasy camp called Ballers, not to be confused with The Rock's HBO show of the same name. The movie was originally supposed to star Kevin Hart, along with every other comedy currently in development in Hollywood, but he dropped out. And you thought we'd do the news without mentioning The Rock. Psst. Come on, it's Film HQ. <laughs> we love The Rock. The Ghost in the Shell, the controversial movie starring Scarlett Johansson in a traditionally Asian role, which looks a lot like a cross between The Matrix, The Fifth Element, iRobot, Ex Machina, Blade Runner, Judge Dredd, Her, and Requiem for a Dream, released five 10 to 15 second micro clips, which made me jump out of my shell. So do I know what this movie is about? Absolutely not. But if I don't see it, will I ever know if I'm truly human? I'm Josh Makoga. I'm Halad Olamu, and that is this week's news. Up next, I had the pleasure of speaking with Greg McLean, director of Wolf Creek, and upcoming thriller The Belco Experiment, written and produced by James Gunn, which got rave reviews at the Toronto International Film Festival. Check it out, guys. All right, we're here with Greg McLean. You directed Wolf Creek. It comes out October 14th on Pop TV. I watched all of it. I don't want to spoil anything for the fans out there, but. Man, this is a this is a dark series. You're you're a dark guy. It's a horror show. Yeah. <laughs> What's it meant to were you, be? Were, are you a scary guy? Are yeah, you I'm terrified, as you can see. Yes, I'm I can terrified. tell. People shot it when I entered the room. 
Um, it's always the quiet ones you've got to watch. Yeah. So there's the reason why people say, he was such a nice guy before they <laughs> uncover the bodies. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, it's, you know, look, I think everyone's fascinated with sort of the dark side of life. But when we did the very first film, when I was writing it, I basically did have to kind of go into a fairly dark place to access the truth of this character because yeah. it's, you know, to take it seriously and to research, you know, cases like this, characters like this. And it was extremely intense. Now, I remember a period when I was writing where it was just like, this is, I've just got to get out of this headspace because it's really <laughs> disturbing. Yeah. When John the actor joined, on, joined the movie, he went very method in trying to work out how to do the character. Method in not killing people, but... <laughs> In trying to I should disclaim method not I'm killing not, people. Yes. Yeah. Well, there uh, were well, look, so okay, there were some casualties, <laughs> but you know, it was um, just a bad day on craft. It was a we bad. It was it. a bad day. Yeah. We didn't see those crew members again. Yeah. But no, he did a whole lot of his own work and credited the character. And then when he came back to it in the second movie in the in the series, he was able to access it more easily because he already kind of credited the, the big items of the character, the walk, the physicality, the the ideas the mental state he had to be in to uh, play the character. Congratulations. I think a lot of fans also want to know, you just had a really successful, like last week here with the Belco experiment, right. which you directed, James Gunn yes. uh, of Guardians of the Galaxy, fame wrote it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Belco experiment? It's a movie that James wrote many years ago, and then he was doing Guardians 2, mm -hmm. and you know, they sent out a script, and it, it's, a, it's just a mind-blowingly cool concept. And it's a concept that could go either way, but when you add to this very simple concept about a bunch of American workers in a South American um, office building being trapped in the building, being forced to fight to the death, when you add James Gunn's humor and com and black comedy into that, it just becomes it becomes really crazy, and you know, it's completely insane. Yeah. Which is why I loved it. That's yeah. why I wanted to make it. When you were on set, did you ask James or anything about any crazy Marvel stories that he may have? I really love Marvel movies, yeah. so I was just just you know, trying to find out anything I possibly could. Geeking He's fairly tight-lipped about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know. I think everybody like attacks him social media wise, like where is that trailer right. for Guardians 2? I know, he's now, got, he's now got two problems. He's got, where's the Guardians trailer? Like five million Facebook you know, <laughs> quick requests a day. Yeah. And then a hundred Twitter requests, where's the Belco trailer? Yeah. So, you know. That's his problem. I don't know. <laughs> I'm terrible at social media, so I'm glad I'm not having to respond to all those well, fans. Well, you're terrible at social media, but you're great at creating villains oh, who are you. terrible in real life. Right. So thank congrats you. on that. Uh, I want to end the interview. I do a lot of rapid fire questions. Right. You want to do a little rapid sure. fire? All right. Did Liam Neeson beat that wolf at the end of The Grey? I don't think so. No. There was many wolves. Yeah, they all, they might have come from uh, Wolf Creek, if you will. See what they did? They okay, might, yes. Terrible. Who is better with a knife? Crocodile Dundee or Mick Taylor. Mick Taylor. <laughs> Mick Taylor would eat Crocodile Dundee for breakfast. Okay, the Belko experiment. Yes. You think it would be better as the Balky Bartokamus experiment? <laughs> no, it's a <laughs> terrible idea. <laughs> Honestly, can anyone throw a Bowie knife like that? Uh, I can. You can? I can. Get out of here. I grew up on a farm. I was throwing knives from, you know, day dot. Mm. I, yeah, I can do that. Give me a Bowie knife. <laughs> we don't carry Bowie knives in the well, office. Well, for good reason. <laughs> obviously, the Belko experiment would go. Where do you rank Mick Taylor as in the greatest villains of all time? Number one. Number one. Well, I mean, I, personally, I'm a huge fan. Obviously, I'm biased. Um, I think he's up there. And then maybe the show will kind of introduce more Americans to the joy of Mick Taylor. Freddie, Jason, Mick, Mick Taylor. Mick Taylor. Greg McLean, you're the man. Antoine Fuqua and Denzel Washington are together again with the newest incarnation of the Magnificent Seven. Gray, you had a chance to go and check this one out. What did you think? Fun. Loved it. Nice. Don't care about Westerns. <laughs> Kinda cared about this one. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, what were your initial reactions to it? I love Westerns. Mm. I did not love this one. Of course you did. Oh. But <laughs> only because if we dig into it, like, you do not, it starts with kind of the reason we're gonna assemble this Magnificent Seven. Right, I didn't yeah. care about that whatsoever. I did not care about the town they were trying to save or the people in it. I cared about the dudes. But they were so downtrodden, Kara. They were, <laughs> they, they were, were like oppressed. fake downtrodden. I just didn't care about them. I cared about the guys. I wish I had, I wish it was a whole movie about the guys just going around to towns and improving little, little stores and going to the, <laughs> going to the, <laughs> going to the whorehouses and like <laughs> having a good time and just joking on each other, drinking and playing poker. <laughs> what what if they great. turned Magnificent Seven into an HGTV show? <laughs> Yes, You know what great we'll go great over here? An um, R-rated one. You know, <laughs> Good Night is particularly good with window dressing. <laughs> you know what? Me, myself, I was surprised. I really enjoyed it. And I shouldn't have been surprised because I really have enjoyed it when Antoine Fuqua and Denzel Washington worked together. I've really liked Equalizer, yeah. well, like, more than most yes. people. And I should say, like, I didn't 
hate it. I mean, I just, it was so close to being great. Because you have such great talent, you have really great action sequences, but it was so close to being great, that's why I was disappointed that it's like, ah, oh, if I had just cared about these people yeah. and like the whole premise, but. See, for me though, that, that classic setup of the evil gold baron threatening the town, I mean, it's yeah. such a surface, trope, if you will, but it was the right one to use to just really set that great classic Western feel because what we really cared about was the Magnificent Seven. Yes. We cared about them. Now, look, I thought the way they handled the introductions of each character and their motivations for getting involved a little thin, but once they were all together doing their thing, you know, Kingpin's in there, D'Onofrio, first of all, I adored his character. Like, yeah. When yes. he came on screen, I expected that kingpin voice. Like, uh, you know, those, those guys hit me over the head with a rock. They hit me over the head with a rock. I'm like, this is going to be awesome. Yeah, he made a choice. Yes. And it was interesting. Yeah. And I can't argue out that there was no characterization, but what I liked about it was that it was so classic, but the action was so modern that together those two things made me actually want to watch a Western, and so I was into it. I was like, yes, Chris Pratt, tell me another joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get down to brass tacks with Magnificent Seven. If you had to give it a score out of 10, which you do, what do you give the Magnificent Seven? I'm gonna say that it's like 7.5 for me because it's like just above average, and I was into it. Yeah, I actually quite enjoyed it. I'm gonna give it, no pun intended, I'm gonna give it a seven. Well, I'm gonna give it a seven too, but I still, but I still think a seven is a seventy percent. It's not like it's, it's not passing. great. Correct. It's sort of it no. could have been great. If you want great, watch the one with Steve McQueen. Yes. I mean, let's be real. Yeah. But yes. it, this is a fun movie, and I think yes. I think it's gonna introduce people to westerns that have ne maybe never even seen one. Yeah. All right, now the other film that opened wide this week was a movie uh, that has looked just awful, uh, and that is the new animated film, Storks. I thought this thing looks terrible. Now, funny thing, about about two weeks ago, I was in a theater and I saw a new trailer for Storks that for the first time actually made me grin and chuckle a bit. Huh. I'll leave this one off. I went to go see Storks the other night, and you know what? I liked it. I had a good time with it. And I, I'll mention this again later, but you know, it's one of those situations where what we often find ourselves in the position is in is watching a movie that's pretty good, and then they blow the ending. Mm. To me, Storks was, this is pretty good. It has some good laughs, some decent little moments in it, but they nail the ending. To me, the last five minutes of this movie, I was just entranced. And I was with a friend of mine who is a dad, and I caught him out of the corner of my eye doing, of course. Yeah. Doing this the, and the side, I thought it was just a terrific ending. That's where the movie really, really hits the bullseye, is the, the whole relationship between why we love babies so much and how mm. crazy they are, and it's fun to be a family and all that nonsense. P.S., <laughs> this is my unauthorized life story. <laughs> like, just to be clear, watch the movie and pretend that that is me. Are you actually orphan tulip? I am. I, that was how I was born, is out of a baby. <laughs> what did you think, Kara? I loved loved i did not expect to cry and i don't i mean i'm just like what's happening in my older age that i cry at everything but <laughs> it's, i in like talking to some of the actors about it it nick stoller is behind this and you know we know him from like raunchy comedy that, right. that usually has a little bit more depth and it's a love letter to like being a parent and wanting to have a kid and the, how crazy it can be how tough it is, and sneakily sends this really heartfelt message that you kind of weren't expecting because it's, you know, cute birds and cute animated babies right. and kids and wolves. <laughs> There's a great segment Oh, the wolves, wolves okay. are great. The penguins are great. Wolves, like, f definitely the so finest funny. cinematic wolf showings. <laughs> so funny. It's like... The howling uh, and like the gray and yeah. <laughs> if Liam BS. Neeson had worked a little bit of that into his <laughs> film, it could have been a lot more successful. With Kean Peel doing the voices, <laughs> mwah, perfection. Like the wolf parts were so deeply funny to me so that good. that in combination with just that human mushy gushy little warm fuzzy feelings. I was like, this is a great movie. It and turned speaking, out to be great. Speaking of voices, I was not expecting much from Andy Samberg doing, but I thought his voice is the lead character. I love Kelsey Grammer as the boss. Like whenever he spoke, I just, I was chuckling a bit. It's okay, we're gonna start with you this time. You have to give a score out of 10 to Storks. What do you give it? Nine. Totally really? Give it a nine. I just think it's it has way more depth for adults and you can totally take your kids to it and not worry about having the birds and the bees conversation because they, gra <laughs> they grace over the, the stork 
aspect in a really fun way. I loved, I thought it was so cute. I thought it was creative. I thought it was really well done the way they took liberties with the whole where do babies come from question. Yeah. There are multiple answers to that question and the Starks are just yeah. one of them. I like the family dynamic of the little boy and his parents. I thought that was really cute and endearing uh, on all the ways it should have been. I really enjoyed it, so I'm also going to give this one a seven. Yeah, this one has an eight for me. Solid eight. I had so much more fun than I thought I would. And it taught me where babies come from. <laughs> <laughs>《Film HQ》fans, we are here with this week's Power Rankings. John, a couple movies hit theaters this weekend. Did they make the Power Rankings? A couple of them did, starting off with our number five best film in theaters right now, the brand new animated film, Storks. I gotta tell you, I thought this movie looked like a bag of crap. However, <laughs> it was more charming and funnier. And you know what? A lot of times movies come along where it's like, they're okay, but then they ruin the ending. This movie was a little bit better than okay, and then I thought nailed the ending. 58% critic rating right now, really? so it's a little bit divisive with the critics. Oh. Personally, I liked it, so it comes in at our number five spot. Storks, our good buddy, Stephen Glickman. And yes, that's right. What's in the four spot? Coming in number four is the other new film with a 63% critic rating. It's The Magnificent Seven. I had a very good time with this yeah. film. It was definitely a modern retelling of it, but it felt like it had enough of those classic Western tropes, the good guys versus the bad guys, you know, the, the men for hire coming <laughs> in to fight the evil gold baron. Yeah. It was all there. It was great. Denzel Washington is great. I'm a big fan of Antoine Fuqua. The Magnificent Seven comes in at number four. Who gave the best performance of the seven? Handsome Hawk. Oh. Handsome Hawk, I thought. All right, what's in the three position? Coming in number three is that surprise horror of the movie of the year for me. It's Don't Breathe. This movie had me on the edge of my seat, my stomach in knots, but laughing and jumping at the same time. 88% critic rating right now. Steven is so good in this movie. Slanging it up. Make sure you get out and check out Don't Breathe while it's still in theaters. Where, let's just say you threw this year, where would you put Steven Lang's performance as far as like villainous madmen? Oh, I don't know I can put anybody above him at this point. Wow. It was really good. All right, what's two? Okay, coming in number two to me is by far and away the best animated film of the year. And that's saying something. This has been a pretty good year for animated yeah. films. And that's Kubo in the Two Strings. A remarkable 97% critic rating right now. It's just an amazing film, mixing great elements of Eastern storytelling with Western. It's just fantastic. And quote unquote, animation because this is stop, it's a stop motion masterpiece. It's a really interesting hybrid of digital technology with old classic stop motion animation yeah. to amazing effect. It really is something to see. And sticking in the number one spot, holding on to the number one spot, one of the best films of the year, Hell or High Water, holding that 98% critic yeah. rating. You got Christopher Pine, you got Jeff Bridges. I mean, the movie is just fantastic. It is a true modern context Western with yeah. a lot of those classic tropes, but it is just a magnificent film. Check out Hell or High Water. The newest incarnation of The Magnificent Seven takes over theaters this weekend, so the gunslinging crew at Film HQ decided to break down their top five favorite Western movies of the new millennium. So, meet us out front at high noon. It's time for a top five. Kicking our list into high gear in fifth place is Appaloosa. Legendary actor Ed Harris stepped behind the camera to direct this film, where two lawmen for hire try to clean up a town in the Old West. I'll kill you both. Bush. Movie experts everywhere consider the two stars, Viggo Mortensen and Ann Harris, to have the best scowls in all of Hollywood. And they use them to shoot guys who pee in bars. Just use the bathroom next time. Pulling into this station in fourth place is 2007's 310 to Yuma. Christian Bale, Russell Crowe, and Ben Foster shoot all the bullets and explode all the bombs available in the Western United States in this, the second adaptation of Elmore Leonard's short story. You never knew when to shut up. Even bad men love their mamas. We don't want to spoil it too much, but let's just say the train may have arrived a bit behind schedule. In the third position is the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Imitation is the highest form of flattery, but stalking out someone and trying to be them is just plain creepy. How come George had a grudge against you? Well, you see, his nephew had $5,000 on him. It just so happens he winds up killed. And when George is in prison, someone whispers to him, was Jesse James slit the boy's throat. But let's be honest, if wanting to be a train robbing Brad Pitt is wrong, we don't want to be right. In the runner-up position is Quentin Tarantino's much beloved Western tale of revenge, Django Unchained. Christoph Waltz won a Best Supporting Actor Oscar and Tarantino won for Best Original Screenplay, but the standout star was Jamie Foxx as Django, a freed slave who mows down an entire plantation of sociopaths in one of the most fulfilling quests for vengeance a movie-going audience has ever seen. Carried away with your retribution. You lose sight of why we're here. 
You think I lost sight of that? Yes, I do. Stop antagonizing Candy. You're going to blow this whole charade, or more than likely get us both killed. And I, for one, don't intend to die in Chickasaw County, Mississippi, USA. D-J-A-N-G-O. The D is silent. And finally, earning its place at the top of our list of 2000's westerns is 2010's True Grit. Nominated for 10 Oscars, this Coen Brothers remake of John Wayne's only Oscar-winning role won over audiences and critics alike, and introduced the world to Haley Steinfeld. I have come to take you back to Fort Smith. I think I will oblige the officers to come after me. Well, if you refuse to go, I will have to shoot you. You will not go with me? No, it's just the other way around. You're going with me. It also taught us a very important lesson. Don't fall down a hole with rattlesnakes in it. Well, partner, there's your top five westerns of the new millennium. Order yourself a sarsaparilla, pull up your bootstraps, saddle up, and ride off into the sunset. Or to your local movie theater this weekend to see The Magnificent Seven and see if it deserves a place amongst these great modern-day westerns. All right, so the circumstances under which the last Fast and the Furious movie got finished were remarkable and unfortunate, all at the same time, to say the least. And I was really somebody who admired the way the studio, the filmmakers, handled and kind of navigated that the terrible tragedy, the loss of Paul Walker. And I thought that was great. Now, then they give the character a great send-off, very emotional. Yeah. Uh, you know, music videos were made about it, and it was really well done. But now we're talking about the possibility that Paul Walker's character may make an appearance in the Fast and Furious franchise again. Of course, his uh, Paul Walker's younger brother is mentioning that they had a phone conversation with Vin Diesel and talked about the possibilities of maybe the character appearing again. Kara Warner from People, you hear this news. Would this be a good thing to do for the character just to remind the audience about Paul Walker and, the, and what he had meant to the franchise and remind them that this character is still an important character? Or is it time just to move on from it? Uh, I, slippery slope, because Really, Paul Walker is the one thing I cared about in, right. in the franchise. I love most of the actors. I, Vin Diesel, I think, is just doing this, or whoever, I think they're just doing it for publicity. I don't think, if maybe it's a flashback uh. scenario, maybe. But like, I just uh. don't, I don't think, I don't think it's a good move. It's Dre Drake so... from Psy Magazine. Yeah. <laughs> and Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> What do, you, what do you think about this? Oh, it's so depressing. I don't, I think you're right. And I think they need to leave Paul Walker alone. I think that they need to end on the, very, like you said, the super emotional note, the very high note that they did in the last film and leave it be. I want to see Vin Diesel meaningfully looking at Paul Walker's picture on his nightstand and then we move on to more stuff blowing up. Like, that's what I want to see. I don't want them to do any weird CG stuff. I think it's disrespectful, and it's a cash grab, and it's weird. I don't like it. I hope this is not true. Jason Inman from DC All Access, how do you see it? Uh, I, I'm the same way, but I almost wish that the Fast and the Furious franchise had ended with the happy send-off, because mm. to me that seemed like the perfect ending for this whole franchise, but I get it. Money well, makes more money. you hate money, Jason? I do hate money. Uh, <laughs> but I, I don't know, like... This is a weird circumstance for this because um, the brothers are there and they're like, they seem gung-ho for it. I think they like money as well and Vin Diesel seems gung-ho for it. But like, if you put this into another franchise, would we have liked it if they had CGI'd Heath Ledger into The Dark Knight Rises? Ugh. We would have hated it. Right. And, and, and I think that them doing this for Fast 8 or 9 is the same thing. You know, I, I'm going to have to disagree with you guys on this, on, on this level. I feel like there was a prime opportunity for both the studio and the filmmakers, Vin Diesel and everybody, to take advantage and cash in on the tragedy of Paul Walker with that last in the Fast and the Furious movie. They could have done a lot, but they handled it with a lot of class and a lot of grace. And I've always been the kind of guy who thinks the character is bigger than the actor who performs him a little bit. And to me, it seems like... If he's his brother and the father to Vin Diesel's character's uh, ch nephew or niece or whatever the sex of the baby was at the same time, it would almost seem out of place that if you do go a couple movies that even a phone call isn't made at some point or maybe I could use some advice uh, from my friend on the phone and then to be able to include Paul's family in that process. I absolutely see where you guys are coming from, I do. I just kind of see it from the opposite point of view that I actually think it'd be kind of sweet but Schnepp from Collider Heroes, how do you think this is all working out? 
Well, if it's called you know, Fast and the Furious Ghost Call, then maybe the oh. walkers are from another dimension ghost and Paul. there's some conjuring stuff. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Ghost Paul. Um, and the walkers are there, they're kind of translucent and floating and have superpowers. This is so not going to happen. This is like, I, I, I'm on the fence of like, if this is even real. Because it's like, I think that they sent off Paul Walker in the most, the greatest way they possibly could. They finished that film under dire and horrible circumstances, a real death. And I thought, you know, they did a great job finishing that, finishing that movie and also kind of paying tribute to Paul Walker in the same breath with his brothers participating. If there was a phone call, that would be the, the, the most that would be expected. It would be from far away, like a helicopter shot from the back of his head. And you'd see the kid. He's like, maybe that. But I doubt that's even going to happen. I think they're, that none of this is real. They're and I'm a ghost. trying to keep mm -hmm. it in the news. Yeah. That's all they're doing. Yeah. All right. Well, now, speaking of news, Star Wars is rarely not in the news. And it's certainly in the news this week. Bob Iger was recently uh, having some conversations and expressing the fact that people need to temper their expectations about what kind of results we should get from Star Wars Rogue One. Basically saying, look, Rogue One is not going to be as big of a hit as The Force Awakens. Schnepp, you hear this. Could Rogue One be a bigger hit than The Force Awakens, or is he absolutely right that we shouldn't even expect it to come close to that? I think he's absolutely right. And I mean, there's no reason for him to not be saying this. These are all the shareholders. He's like, look, Easy. It's going to make a billion dollars. You're all rich. This is Star Wars. Just relax. This is like the... And him calling it an experiment is just him saying, it's a it's an offshoot. We were used to these sequels that have the Skywalkers and all, right. the, and all that kind of... This is still going to probably have mention of Luke Skywalker. Maybe you're going to see Princess Leia in there. Obviously, Darth Vader's in it. It's not like it's in some bizarre other universe that has nothing to do with Star Wars. It is a Star Wars movie, but it's not following that same storyline. So that's why he called it an experiment. Also, another way to, like, ease the shareholders into, like, you might have heard about these reshoots, billion. Like, you know, he's just letting billions <laughs> mm. know, but not three billion, maybe one billion. So they're like, okay, we get it. So that when it, if it does make two billion, everyone's going to be happy. If it makes one billion, everyone's going to be happy. If it makes four billion, everyone's going to be ecstatic. The experiment worked, you know? Kara, you hear about this. Is Bob Iger underestimating the potential of Rogue One, or is he right on the money with this? I don't think I, again, with... I'm just jaded about the PR plays because I just think <laughs> it, it is a great PR play to tell your sh your shareholders who are only caring about the bottom line. They don't care about the quality of the picture. They just care about if it makes money. So I think he's just tempering expectations in a business standpoint. And, you know, putting that quote out there gets people talking, both from the fan community and the business communities. They're like, wow, I guess we are not going to expect it to be that that great, that good. And then when it exceeds expectations, no harm, no foul. I think it's, I think it's a strategic move. Disney, I mean, Bob Iger and that entire mouse house, they know what they're doing. They're usually the smartest people in the room. Yes. Gray, what are the chances, though, that a rogue one could come out and cross that $2 billion mark that The Force Awakens did? I think the chances are fantastic. Really? Because this franchise keeps getting, well, we can't say it keeps getting better because it got worse <laughs> before it got better again. Recently, it's been getting better. I'm doing the math. It's not my strong suit. It's Sly Magazine. Lisa, I think you're doing a good job. <laughs> um, so, but I think the chances are great because I think that they have finally figured out to do maybe a little bit more of the Marvel style, like get new talent, get exciting people making this, these movies. Right. And I think that it's going to be, I think the chances are fantastic for it, especially the time of year that it's coming out. There's not a lot of competition in that realm. And just with Star Wars stamped on it, after The Force Awakens means money, money, money. Yeah, like all other studios are diving out of the way of Star Wars and these release dates like guppers from a great white shark that's coming <laughs> totally. through. So Jason, like really, then what should we be expecting box office wise from a movie like Rogue One? I think we'll see matched with Force Awakens, really? if not higher. Wow. Because I agree, I agree with Gray. I think that the Star Wars franchise is now a snowball and there is no stopping this thing. I also think that this is going to have a little bit of a Guardians of the Galaxy effect to bring back that, that Marvel parallel. I think people won't know what to expect with this movie. They'll go see this movie, and if the word of mouth is slightly positive, it's on fire. Right. I, you know, I, I kind of find myself agreeing with Bob Iger a little bit. I love The Force Awakens. I, I thought it was fabulous. I believe the franchise is doing this right now. But when The Force Awakens was coming out, 
There hasn't been a movie, our friend Mark Ellis mentioned this, and I agree with him, there hasn't been a movie with this much anticipation and this much excitement since The Phantom Menace. I mean, it was just, it was the return, right? It was, the Star Wars was coming back, and then they had that trailer where we get to see Han Solo again saying, mm -hmm. Chewie, we're home. And Darth Maul's gonna be such a good villain. <laughs> but, uh, but this one almost has the same thing with Darth Vader. Coming if back. they capitalize yeah. on that a little bit, and I'm, I feel like maybe Darth Vader is probably going to have like a five to ten minutes of screen time, <laughs> whereas with Han Solo, and I'm glad they're not misleading the audience into mm -hmm. thinking that Vader's going to be in a whole bunch of this, but I will totally take that all back. If they put out the next trailer and they show a battlefield, like this, there's a frame of this out of one of the Vader Down comics. If they show a scene in the next trailer of a battlefield with like, 200 rebel soldiers surrounding Darth Vader, and this is right out of the comic, surrounding Darth Vader and saying you're surrounded, and then you see Darth Vader, the lightsaber turn on, and Vader says, I am only surrounded by fear and dead men. <gasps> Boom! Ooh. Everybody's gonna go see that movie. Uh -huh. Like Vader taking Twice. out 200 yeah. fools? Yeah. Are you kidding me? You yeah. know that's like, not gonna happen. I know that's <laughs> not gonna happen. Sorry to be the crusher of dreams. Why do you have to ruin everything? <laughs> hey, remember, you said it's experimental, like it's maybe a Stan Brackage Star Wars movie. We don't know what's happening. I was finally starting to get something nice and you took it away from me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Film HQ. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen, lots of great programming here on Comic-Con HQ. Make sure you are subscribed. You can sign up monthly or you can sign up for the year. We'll be back again next week. Thanks for joining us. My name is John Campion. Until then, bye-bye.